to work will know that he's an extremely uh, talented artist with a unique technique, uh, with interesting uh, theme uh, behind his art. He is one of those artists that is involved in charcoal drawing on canvas or on paper. And I can think of only two artists uh, that uh, have used charcoal as, as a main uh, thing. Jimmy Ong was one, and Namasi Bayam. And both of these artists actually has uh, represented uh, their paintings in terms of uh, people, you know, uh, major, huge uh, portraits of people. So Henry's work is very different. If you, if you were to see it later, you realize it's uh, crowded with a lot of things. Uh, it deals with a very broad subject of the whole cosmos. And I think that uh, relationship of looking at this macro view of the world and the cosmos uh, is interesting. Besides that, obviously, he, he does have uh, some personal representations within these big, large works. And thirdly, I guess what is important for any artist is uh, that he's a commercially viable artist. He has commercial success. He has sold many of his works. And uh, it does show that the local Singaporeans have an appreciation for his art. And so he's been able to uh, sell his art quite well. And so we'll be able to pursue that as well. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to start with uh, uh, the dialogue with Henry. I, I hope all of you uh, following will take note of it. And if you want to ask questions, as Nancy said, uh, you can do so. So given your success as a chemical engineer, Henry, what made you decide uh, to take art as a serious uh, uh, career, as it were? Well, I've always liked to, to draw, except that uh, I've never actually considered it um, as a viable career path while I was growing up. So at every major juncture in my life where, where you know, I could have chosen art instead of, of something else, I, I have always chosen the, the sciences because I thought that that was a practical choice. And um, there was a part of me that also wanted to keep, uh, I suppose, drawing and art as uh, something private because, you know, it's something that I enjoy. And I wasn't sure if I became an examinable subject, you know, whether I would continue to enjoy doing it. So that, that kind of continued. And um, chemical engineering became a, a natural choice because, you know, of, of my choices all along up to JC. You know, I was always a science student. So... But what I didn't count on was that that subsequently when I entered NUS, you know, <laughs> I, I I realized that oh, I actually don't don't enjoy it. But uh, I didn't I didn't um, know what to do, what else to do. So I I, I persevered and I finished uh, the course. And then uh, when I came out to work, I went I went to work for a few years, and um, I worked in a different field. I, I worked in publishing for a few years. And it was actually, you know, my interactions with, with the editors of, of the journals that I managed that, that kind of inspired me because I had, I had journals that um, changed covers, cover images, uh, every issue. And I was amazed at, at, at how, how, how they could come out with the most interesting images from the most unlikely of sources because these were academic journals. So, you know, they deal with a lot of microscopic images of, of things running the plethora of them. Um, from cells to cadavers to plants. So while, while doing this job, I realized that, hmm, maybe, you know, I, I should have, maybe I should, I should at least, you know, pursue art as, as something to tick off the bucket list so that, you know, I, I don't have any regrets later on. So I took a leap of faith and I enrolled myself into the uh, Well, thank you. The thing that I guess most uh, viewers and Singaporeans will have at the back of their mind is that what your, was your parents' reaction to your choice of taking art or pursuing art when you had a chemical degree uh, uh, degree at hand and why did you suddenly decide to go into art which very few parents in Singapore uh, really support and encourage their children to do so. 
Well, I, I think there were there were a few reasons. I think one of the biggest push was in fact my my sister, because she she had the courage to pursue pursue art uh, when she went to the university. So that was that that kind of kick started, you know, that that all the questions in my head, you know, like what if I, I I had chosen art instead of the sciences all along, and um, I'm also very lucky because um. My, my parents were, were very supportive. In fact, um, they, they've never actually imposed, you know, this, this, this choices upon me. I, it was basically all, all on my own doing, you know, because I thought that that was a practical thing to do. Yeah, so I'm very lucky that they have been uh, very, very encouraging and supportive, you know, of my choice to take this leap of faith. Yeah, well, you know, you are unique in the sense that you have pursued art in a very formal manner by taking a degree at NAFA, your BA degree in art, and then pursuing an MA degree at La Salle. Why did you do that? Well, I, I, I've never had any formal, formal education in art before, before that. And um, one of the things that I really wanted to have was to learn how to draw. So, you know, NAFA is traditionally known to have a very strong foundation in, 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 uh, in artistic techniques. So that was why I thought that, you know, if, if I, I want to if I want to do this, you know, seriously, then maybe I, I need to enroll myself into art school and get a formal education, you know, how to, do, how, go, how to go about doing this. And um, I was also thinking to myself that at the very, at the very least, if, I find out that you know after after three three years of doing the diploma that I'm actually not good at this, then you know at, at it's as at most you know a, a holiday for me you know so to speak that you know three years to go back to art school, yeah. But thankfully that didn't happen and I enjoyed my time in 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 Nafa so much that I decided you know what I'm going to continue and do the BA in Nafa. <laughs> yeah. Well, you're lucky in a sense because NAFA and La Salle are going to be uh, amalgamated as an arts university. So you might be a suitable candidate as a lecturer in <laughs> at the school. <laughs> you never know, right? It's yeah. a possibility. But I wanted to ask you, uh, having come from both the schools, the leading art schools in Singapore, uh, in a way rivals to some extent, what is it you felt you learned at these different schools. What was different at these different schools? I know these are leading things. You might get into trouble <laughs> by, by talking about them. But I'm, I'm sure people are just interested in know uh, what is the difference between going to the Nafa school as opposed to going to the La Salle school. Mm. Well, I, I do feel that um, increasingly they, they are becoming similar in, in their approach to, to art. Um, simply because of of um, the, of keeping up with the times, but um, speaking from my own experience, which is several years ago, I I mean I enrolled into Nafa because you know I wanted to to build a strong foundation in in, in my basic techniques, which was something that Nafa gave me, and when I decided to do my MA. I, I was thinking of um, conceptual development. And uh, I felt that that's, that's actually something that, that La Salle, you know, when, he, when it was founded, that was something that they've always wanted to do, to, to, to be at the forefront of, of uh, conceptual development, to be, to be the avant-garde. So I felt that, you know, when, when I, I decided to do my MA, that was a natural choice for me. And uh, I have to say that, that it was a significant turning point in, in, in the way I, I was, um, I, I go about doing my, my art practice because um, later on, you will see that there is a, a change in, in, the, in, in the aesthetics of, of my works as compared to my time prior to, to La Salle and also the, the subsequent the newer works, which are featured in binary systems. From the point of view of the viewers, I'm sure we'd like to know just how many students were there at the PA course in art at NAFA? Um, the, the cohort in, in, in NAFA, the BA cohort is generally smaller. 
uh, the course in La Salle is definitely uh, more popular in that sense. And uh, La Salle has always had a bigger cohort in, in terms of the PE course. Yeah. But um, I mean, both schools have their own strengths. And uh, I think it's good that, that they, they are coming together because, you know, they, they will be able to pull their resources together and that will only benefit the, the students, especially when the, they are able to, at least uh, from, from the reports we've seen so far, they are able to take courses from uh, both, both schools. So that is uh, only be beneficial, you know, in terms of, of uh, developing the students' potentials. For what I little I know, did the uh, last well, thousands you have quite a lot of expatriates, right? Teachers, is that true? Uh, as opposed to Napa? Mm, I think there is a, a, a good mix. I wouldn't say there is more per se. Yeah, but uh, they, I, if, if my experience is at least in, in terms of students. Uh, both, both schools are quite international. They do have a good mix of, of international students. Um, my experience in, 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 M, in the MA course, um, I actually have more local uh, lecturers. Yeah. But my, my interactions is mostly limited to, to the fine art department. Uh, and I'm basically kind of like a hermit because I, my, my studio is in the Winstead campus, which is uh, in the, Hawk, the Newton Food Center. So most of the time I'm like away from all the, 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 the hustle and bustle, you know, that, that's available in the McNally campus. Oh, I see. <laughs> it's considered the, the McNally campus. Huh? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. The <laughs> McNally campus, the one in Wimbledon is the, the, really, the really fancy one. <laughs> <laughs> you know, when you take these uh, academic courses, uh, MA courses, etc. Uh, what do you feel you were doing? Was it that you were you needed to uh, have a confidence boost in your art? Did you feel you needed some kind of academic qualification to give you a sort of sense of uh, you know uh, you know acknowledgement that you were a serious art student? I think it's not so much the acknowledgement I was looking for, at least not initially, because my initial plan, at least when I enrolled into NAFA, was basically to, to have a good grasp of the basics. Yeah. And subsequently, uh, what, what happened was, you know, through my interactions with the lecturers and, and also my classmates, they, what they gave me was, you know, they opened up my mind as to... As to on my knowledge of art and what art could be. I think um, one of the, the, the most important things in, in terms of um, developing your, broadening your, your horizons is being able to interact with people who are also, you know, doing things that you, having the same goals and moving towards the same objective. So being able to, to have a studio space and, and being able to hang out with, with uh, my fellow classmates was something that uh, has been very invaluable in that sense. Yeah, and um, I think the acknowledgement or at least the, the more serious development came about when I started considering doing my BA and my MA. Yeah, because uh, with, with the MA, the MA more specifically because uh, I was thinking, I was at that point in time thinking of what else I could do to push, you know, especially um, the way I, I work with charcoal and also, you know, how else can I develop uh, the, the aesthetics that, that I, I was becoming known for in my earlier works. And it also came to a point where I was asking myself, what else can I do? So the MA specifically was, was I, I saw it as an opportunity to, to push myself conceptually in the sense that, you know, to, to broaden my horizons as to what else I can do uh, conceptually and also visually with the, the, the medium that, that I'm familiar with. You know, your MA degree course, did it come from RMIT or did it come from LaSalle itself? Who issued you this MA certificate? Uh, I came from Goldsmiths College. Oh, Goldsmiths? Yes, Goldsmiths. Goldsmiths gave you the MA 
So you were, LaSalle was just like a conduit for Goldsmith, is it? A representation of Goldsmith? Uh, yes, uh, the, the course is accredited by Goldsmiths. Oh. Yeah. And uh, I think one of the, the most invaluable experience I've had from the MA was um, I had an exchange semester. It just so happened that, that at that point in time, uh, LaSalle was having a collaboration with the Zurich University and they, they had an exchange program and uh, my, another classmate and I had the opportunity to attend this exchange semester and then we, we got to go to Zurich and also to Hong Kong. And that was also another eye opener for me because, you know, I got to interact with people from all over the world, not just Zurich, but also Hong Kong, China, um, Germany, and, uh, Taiwan, Japan. So it was um, a very international program and uh, yeah, and we got to do a lot of things and it was a multidisciplinary program as well. So um, we, we had uh, participants from all walks of uh, all sorts of specialties including dance, including music, not just art, there's also uh, industrial design, journalism even. Yeah, so the collaborations were very interesting because then it, it allowed us to push beyond, you know, our own comfort zone. And especially for me, you know, beyond what I usually do is someone who draws and paints primarily. For the benefit of you, as a, I'm sure we're all interested. What is it, uh, well, we know when you do in university, you know, I mean, you do a thesis and, you know, you get assessed by it or you do several modules, you know, and examinable modules. So what is it that you assess on when you do an MA in fine art? Well, for, for my course, I mean, it, it varies slightly depending on, on, on the, the program that you're signing up for. But uh, the one that I did in, in La Salle, you know, there are two components there is of course like you mentioned you know the thesis the dissertation and um, the other component is the studio practice which is the, the works that we develop in, 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 in the studio so the two are tied together because the dissertation is essentially um, a, a report or a study of, of the, the topics the themes or the methods that you are interested in because, of, because when, we, when we enroll into the, the MA program, we have to submit a proposal as to what we are going to do for the program. So the dissertation essentially is a formalization of that proposal, an in-depth uh, study into that proposal as to all the things that you're interested in that you are going to develop in your work at the, in the studio. And, um, you know, and you'll be formalized in writing in, in, in the format of the dissertation. Well, then, what about your, your BA course? Sir? How were you uh, assessed and given a degree on that? Was it by NAFA or was it also by an overseas college? It's also uh, uh, an overseas uh, university. In, in my case, so the, the, un the accrediting university kind of changes depending on uh, what course you take. And uh, for the final course, during my time, it was accredited by Loughborough University. So again, I was very, I was very lucky to, to have taken that program because included in that program with Loughborough University is an exchange semester to, to in, in Loughborough University. So I, I got I got to spend a semester in Loughborough. Yeah. And they have fantastic um workshop facilities. They are, their printmaking facilities is fantastic. So you know you, you got to you get to they even have a paper making facility, which is something very rare. Yeah, and they even have uh, facilities for lithography, which is also something that is very difficult to find, especially in Singapore, because you know it's so labor intensive, and also uh, you need you need the equipment, which is very quite rare to to find to in Singapore. So, what is a, a sort of a period for a BA and an MA course? How many years do you have to go through to get a BA or an MA? So. For, for the BA in general, it's four years. So in NAFA, what happens is the, 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 their program is structured in such a way that you, you generally have to do the diploma first, which is three years, and then you do a conversion in the BA program, which is one year, so in total four years, and then you graduate with a BA with honors. 
Yeah, for the MA in La Salle, for Fina is uh, one and a half years, so it's three semesters. Oh, and uh, what is the criteria for getting into a BA course? What what makes it like you you know the kind of university you need A levels or baccalaureate or something? So what is it? Uh, uh for okay. the for most of the time, um, at least for NAFA, they they generally they generally open the the the, 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 the places for their own diploma students. Mm -hmm. So one of the, the the specifications is is that you know you need to get a good score for your diploma in, in NAFA before you know you can apply for for um, the BA. And of course, there are basic uh, English requirements because you have you have to write a dissertation. So, they they your English proficiency has to be of a certain level. Otherwise, you will have difficulty uh, completing the dissertation. But uh, I also have classmates. That said, I also have classmates who have come from uh, a different school. They've come from polytechnics, and they apply and they successfully applied to to the BA. So it's it's not it's not an open and shut case because. Uh, they will because you have to also submit a portfolio when when you when you apply for the course and uh, they will look they, they will take the portfolio into consideration as to what you can do during the BA course and likewise for the MA course as well um they they generally for MA they they usually will look at things like whether you have been practicing for at least two years because um again you know the MA course being a postgrad course you know as a certain level of maturity so that's what that's what they look for you know how how, how developed you are in your own personal art, artistic practice and again you they look primarily at your portfolio and also at uh, your proposal but again it's not an open and shut case as to whether you have to have formal uh, artistic education uh, education because i also have classmates who come from uh, different backgrounds different disciplines for example you know i had a classmate who 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 actually majored in architecture, and uh, she 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 successfully she was successfully enrolled into, into the program, and, and uh, she majored in, in drawing while her specialty was drawing, and uh, she, she did the MA course. You know, when you look at, at your friends that who graduated with you in in both Nafa and Nassau. Uh, do you think all of them uh, were able to uh, pursue careers that were tied to their artistic uh, uh, journey, their artistic background? What do you think? Was it a tough thing to get a job or was it something? Well, a lot of people like to ask these questions, you know. I'm just trying to, you know, uh, uh, you can give some, you are in it, so you know what the situation is. Not everybody is going to be a successful artist. You know, the people work for companies, advertising companies, whatever companies there. Yes, I mean certainly not not everyone will go on to to work in, in the arts, and certainly not everyone will will, uh, will will go on to to become an artist. But uh, I do have friends who who went on to work in arts related uh, industry. You know, Galleries, and um, also, I think that the, the probability of, of someone pursuing the arts is higher in the MA course than in the BA course, because when when you come to do your B, you, when you come to do your MA, it, it would have it would have been an indication that you know you, you are you are serious in developing your your artist art practice so in fact many of my my classmates who are in the ma course they they are actually already practicing artists mm -hmm. yeah so in that sense the, the the majority move on to continue doing their, their practice for the MA course. you know just one last question on education is there a possibility of you doing a phd in art is that such a thing <laughs> <laughs> Ah uh, yes, yes. I, I mean, it is a possibility. Uh, but uh, I don't think that is something that I would like to consider at the moment because when you when you pursue a PhD, it would signal that you are 
serious or, or contemplating, you know, moving into academia. And um, right now, I, I guess I'm, I'm far too interested in, in, in painting and drawing, you know, the practical side of art to, to you know, want to go into, into academia. So that's something that I'm, I'm holding off uh, at the moment. Yeah. Okay. Now we're going to turn to, you know, we've finished the education part. Let's turn now to you as an artist and, and, and how you represent your art. And to me, there are two things that are very important uh, for successful artists. One is technique and the ability to master a technique. And the other is your sort of ideology, your vision, your thematic representations of what you want to do. They both uh, sum up uh, uh, successful artists, uh, you know, past and present, as it were. So I'd like to start first with the, the your technique, which to me is very unique, uh, not uh, something that everybody uh, pursues in a serious way. And that is your jackal uh, drawings on canvas and paper. And as I said earlier, there, there are very few local artists uh, who are successful in it, uh, Jimmy Hong and Nava Sibiram, but both of them are very interested in figure art. So the question is that, uh, why is it that you adopted this medium rather than the usual medium of color, of oil, of acrylic, of pastels or something, watercolors, you know. Why was it, uh, what was it that nudged you into looking at uh, uh, charcoal painting? Well, um, actually I, I, am, I am trained, I majored in, in, in painting. Uh, when I was in Nafa, and that was something that uh, that um, I, I I did all the way until my my third year, my final year in doing the diploma. So what happened was it, it had to do a lot with the the themes that I, I'm concerned with, and I I think my move away from color has to do a lot with uh, also the way I see the world. I, I see the world in in shades of gray in terms of the issues that we face. You know a lot, and and in as, as a nod to the theme of, of this show, you know binary systems. I, I don't see the world in terms of of uh, in in a binary way, as in you know it's as in terms of good and evil, you know right and wrong. But many many of the times, you know these the, the issues that we, we face, they they actually exist in a in a in an area in a gray area. So I, I thought that that since you know there is this there is this 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 gray area that I wanted to explore, uh, I thought that it might be interesting to explore the the presentation in a grayscale format, you know, and and to do that I I turned to charcoal. Yeah, and uh, I think perhaps to to illustrate these points, uh, I'm going to show you some slides as to my earlier works, as to the, the things, you know, that, that, that led up to, to the development of this current series, Binary Systems. So to start off, there are actually a few things that, that I would like to share. And the first thing being, let me open up the slides. If someone were to ask me um, uh, to sum up my practice, you know, like what am I about? I, I would probably say this, that I, I'm someone who make up worlds and I weave narratives. And that's because I believe that people instinctively make sense of the world and they communicate their thoughts through narratives. So that is why, that is why my, throughout my works, uh, I tend to invent uh, fictional worlds. And to do that, I think this presentation, in fact, I have, I have uh, separated into three chapters. And each chapter, you will visit a different world that I have created you know, in different phases of my artistic career. So the, in chapter one, you will be exploring a world called Shilak, which is uh, situated in a fictional dimension. And in chapter two, you will be visiting a place called the Every Nowhere, which is kind of like a transitional space between the world of Shilak and our physical reality. 
And in chapter three, we will be coming back um, to home, closer to home, you know, I'll be exploring themes that are closer to our own physical reality. So I draw a lot of inspiration from uh, fiction, especially fantasy and science fiction novels, which is why I, have, I, I developed this habit of creating fictional worlds. And, um, the, and visually I am uh, inspired by a lot of the things I enjoy doing, which is playing PC games and also movies and, and TV shows. And um, of course, that, that is relevant to how I build the worlds. But um, the themes, you know, the issues that I populate are, are things that come from our reality. In, in those are things that are closer to home, like such as current affairs and life in general. So the first place we're going to visit is this place called Shilak. And um, the, the drawings that you will see subsequently, you know, is, is from uh, this place called the Zikan Protectorate, which is uh, kind of is, uh, featured on the left corner of, of this map. And um, these are the first works that I created. And uh, like I mentioned just now, you know, because of, of the way I see the world in terms of gray. So that's why I presented, I started presenting the works in charcoal and charcoal lends uh, a very dusty and a very dramatic uh, moody atmosphere ambience which I, I thought was very effective in, in uh, bringing out the dystopic qualities of, of this, this world, you know, of Shilak. And uh, here are close-ups of, of the two scrolls from the vertical scrolls from the previous slide. You seem to have jumped ahead of what I was saying. <laughs> you got into it as the teams rather than the, the technique which I was uh, trying to concentrate on on uh, charcoal, yeah. Uh, what, uh, was charcoal in a way uh, a medium that you felt you had better control of than uh, let's say uh, if we did something in color that, you know, uh, your, what, what, what was the, the motivating factor behind this? I mean, did it come about by accident or did you have already this issue that, uh, or did it come up about as a result of your academic, uh, uh, you know, uh, courses in uh, Nafa and Lasal? Because both the, the paintings are uh, presentations that you did uh, in these two schools. That, that's actually very that's very actually very interesting because um to be honest uh in the first two years in Nafa, I was very afraid of charcoal because uh, I have I have sweaty palms. So what happens uh, when I use charcoal is I, I leave a lot of sweat stains on the paper. I mean they are impossible to get rid of once you know they they, they appear on the paper because they will start absorbing the charcoal and then it becomes very difficult to erase, erase after that. So in fact, you know, in the first two years, I, I avoided charcoal like the plague. But what happened in, in my final year, uh, which led, you know, to the development of, of these two scrolls is um, I started seeing visions of, of this city. And uh, what I, I, I turned to instinctively was to paint because that was what I trained in, you know, I was, I'm trained in oil painting. So I, I started painting, but the biggest problem I have with, with paint is that I'm actually, despite what you see, you know, in, in the slides, you know, because they're all in, in, in monochromatic, they're all monochromatic compositions, is that I, I, I actually do love color a lot. But that is also my downfall because I love color so much that it actually becomes a distraction to me, especially every time, you know, I develop a new color. I would be very interested to try it on, but once you place you know a new color onto the canvas it changes the the balance of of the painting and then you have to basically rework the color scheme of the painting and this keeps and, and with oil you know because it's, it's slow drying you can keep going on and on and on and on doing this and um, one of the observations my, my my lecturers made you know when when they saw me doing this over and over again is that um they feel that the energy, you know, the spontaneity is, is lost through the 
many iterations of, of painting and repainting that I keep doing for the same work. And they suggested that I consider going back to drawing again, to going back to dry media. And that kind of kick-started again, you know, my experiments back into dry media, into pastels and into charcoal. And it was at that point in time when, uh, when, when, when I was doing all these experiments that I, I managed to overcome, you know, this, this uh, problem with the sweat stains, especially on paper, because I realized that I don't have to rub the charcoal using my fingers. I can, I can use other, other things available. I know since I'm a painter, brushes are, are the, the most uh, mix of available thing and also tissue paper. So once I got around the problem of, of not touching the paper, not coming into contact with the paper with my sweaty palms, you know, that was a eureka moment for me. I realized that, oh, okay, charcoal is finally something that I can work with without, you know, any worry of, of messing it up. Well, I mean, the distinction, obviously, uh, that I see from, you know, your work is that, uh, you're basically a, a, a person who is drawing things as opposed to someone who is painting things. You know, you're drawing things. And, um, and, 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 and so it can very be, as you can see here, very geometric, very uh, definitive. In the, well, in the sense of oil, you know, it's, we can go from impressionistic right to abstract, you know, in paintings, and and we don't uh, 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 know where the beginning and the end is, or some type of painting. So, uh, would you say your personality uh, it comes into play when you say, uh, "I like to do uh, charcoal," because in a way, I, I like to define what I'm doing. In, in, in terms of the drawing. You like to make it real, as it were, not something that is just, you know, a smudge of, of, of paint or something. But you like to, you, you can see the detail in which you, these drawings are. It's an amazing amount of detail. I don't think you can do that with, 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 with paintings per se, but in drawings, yeah, it seems to me that, you know, and you must have some really strong ideas of, of, of what you want to draw, that word. and that comes through in these paintings and in your in your drawings as well. So uh, I'm just trying to to see where is it that you are coming from, uh, and whether this is the medium that you want to be associated in the future. Yeah, I mean you you are right, and. Um... What I'm trying to do here is a juggling act. Uh, in my earlier work, certainly, you know, the, the drawing element comes across uh, very strongly because a lot of the works, especially, you know, these two scrolls that you see here are uh, drawings on paper. But, uh, and these were developed during my, my time in the diploma. But uh, moving forward, I started to explore again, you know, how I could incorporate uh, my painting techniques into, into the work because uh, I was interested you know, in, in, in being able to present the works on a canvas format. So, and also there is a, a major drawback of using charcoal in the sense that um, charcoal is loose, it's powdery and it will, it will flick off. So uh, a fixative is required. But unfortunately, the, the fixatives are, are toxic so it, you have to work in a well-ventilated environment in order to, to use a fixative. And um, I was thinking ahead, you know, like currently I went back in the time when I was in school, you know, I had the luxury of, of, of a studio. And, and I'm, but even then, you know, every time I wanted to, to, to fix the work, I had to, I couldn't spray in the, in, in the studio because it was an indoor environment. And I didn't want to poison everyone, you know, along, along with me, you know, because it's an, it's an indoor environment, it's an air-conditioned environment. So the, the, the aerosols will, will linger in the studio. So I had to cut, you know, all these paper rolls out into, 
in, into the courtyard, spray it, wait for it to dry, then cut it back into the studio again and continue working. And I thought to myself, no, 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 this is, this is not sustainable, especially for large scale works. And uh, that kind of kickstarted, you know, what else I could do to, to fix this problem, literally. Like how else can I fix the charcoal? And that was, uh, that solution came when, you know, I started incorporating painting into the work in the sense that uh, I use acrylic paint, clear acrylic paint, and that became the fixative. And uh, there was, that also eliminated the problem of, of these aerosols lingering in the air. Yeah. In terms of, um, of, of like what you mentioned just now, you know, whether, you know, charcoal kind of reflects my personality. I, I think in a way it does in the sense that um, I, I feel that that color, we are inundated by color every day. We are surrounded by color every day. And also because I like to create, uh, uh, I like to create fictional worlds. I like to transport the, the viewer into a, a different dimension. In that sense, because of, of um, perhaps the themes that I, 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 I tend to explore, um, whether it's dystopic or, or in the case of um, binary systems, is something more quiet and contemplative, I find color to be a little distracting. So in that sense, charcoal works well for me because I, you are right in the sense that I, I'm very interested in the form, in, in, in also in... Uh, capturing the form. So the works tend to come out more realistic because um, I feel that, because I'm a very, I'm a person who, who likes to weave narratives into the work. So it's also necessary to, for the works to be somewhat realistic in the sense that people are able to recognize you know, the symbols that are embedded in the work. So in that sense, I think realism or, or, or figurative, the figurative way that I work is, is something that is um, necessary in, in, in carrying forth the, the narratives that are embedded in the work. I'd just like to know whether you can name any well-known international artist that has made his name to charcoal painting. Do you know of any? Uh, yes. Um, in fact, one of the, I think one of my biggest inspirations um, William Kenrich, and uh, he does all these amazing charcoal drawings, and uh, he, he even uh, took them as stop motion animation. And uh, so it's, it's basically like watching a movie of, of his uh, charcoal drawings. And another person um, that, that I'm very inspired by, uh, this one not so much, he, 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 he interchanges between his mediums, is um, this artist called Paul Noble. And what he does is he, he creates this very large scale drawings of uh, imaginary cities, which are basically a, a satire of, of, of uh, um, the UK bureaucratic system. So, so it, his works were something that I, I, can't, I, I quite, I, I researched for a fair bit, you know, while developing um, uh, my early works, especially for these two scrolls, since, you know, I was also trying to explore the theme of a dystopia. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, you know, when you uh, are looking at uh, uh, your paintings, especially the earlier works that you presented as your examining uh, pieces in La Salle, I noticed there were very huge paintings. Uh, they were not fit in anybody's house. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so yeah. Uh, like this one here. <laughs> They're just very big. Uh, uh, and part of it is because, you know, uh, I come to the impression that you are trying to uh, provide a storyline within a painting, you know, from one end to the other, you know. And I, I don't know whether that's your intent uh, of doing it, because there are, there are like many scenes and many subplots in there. You know, which is very different. Very few artists do that. They, they just paint one thing and, you know, it's the one scene, you know. But you have an amalgamation of many landscapes, fictional landscapes, that is, you know, with uh, fictional people and characters and, uh, you know, uh, nature. So, uh, 
is that uh, your sort of modus operandi when you deal with art? Is, is that always what you have in mind and trying to create a sort of uh, a narrative to your painting at one go? Yes, yes, that's always something that uh, I'm always very conscious of when I, when I develop my work, the, that uh, I'm always trying to portray a narrative. So in my earlier works, it's, it's about uh, the narrative of uh, the dysfunctionalities of, of modern society, of urbanization, of globalization. And I basically, you know, Although the works are, are situated in fictional worlds, I, I, I essentially, you know, transported, transplanted all these themes, you know, these real, very real themes that we are, we are issues that we are facing, and then I, I simply, you know, extrapolated them, which is something that is unique to science fiction. Science fiction uh, is is basically the extrapolation of of um, current issues into the far future, into a fictional realm. And then, you know, if, more often than not, because they tend to speak about the, the dysfunctionalities of society, the, the worlds that come out of uh, science fiction uh, novels, especially are uh, more often than not dystopias. So that was the, the mechanism that I was exploring in these earlier works, you know, the, the, the idea of a dystopia and how a dystopia can bring about discussion of, of the, the many issues that we face in, in our current society. Yeah. Is it, you know, by doing this, is it, would it be difficult for, uh, you know, an art enthusiast or a viewer to go behind your art to see what you're doing? They, is it, would it be very difficult for someone viewing art to be able to engage in what you had in mind? Is it is your art beyond uh, the sort of appreciation of an ordinary art viewer by doing the things that you do? Because they're so complex, and in a way, they're 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 fictional writers in your head, <laughs> and and not 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 realistic in, in a way that that we can uh, come to terms with. Them. Is that, I guess, the people who bought the art must have this attraction to this seemingly, you know, ambiguous sort of representation of things. What um, do you think? So the way I work is, you know, I, I have to, at least, you know, in, in, in these earlier works is that I, I build the narrative first. Sometimes it's an organic process. Sometimes the visuals come first and then the narrative kind of develops as I develop the, the, the visuals. But more often than not, I have a narrative framework and then the, the scenes that I paint uh, or, or draw, you know, from uh, basically enactments of, of this, these stories that, that I, I, I developed. These are for, I would say, for for my uh, part of my creative process but i don't impose this on the audience because i feel that that one of the the beauty of of uh, appreciating art is you know being able to draw your own conclusions because really you know my my works are, are kind of open-ended questions you know despite you know all the how how heavily laden they are with, with symbols because I don't have any answers when, when I, I'm drawing these things. I'm actually posing them as questions. And so in that sense, they are always open to interpretation as to, and everybody's interpretation will be different because it's, it's largely dependent on, on every, uh, the individual experience. Yeah, so in that sense, there is no one way of reading the work. Um, apart from, you know, the, the, the very obvious um, visuals of it being a dystopia. But uh, I think what happened, you know, along the way is as we move on, you know, uh, all, the, all these works that you, I'm currently showing you right now is that what happened, uh, these are works that I developed during before my MA. And uh, they were all uh, developed based on this dystopia. But what happened along the way is um, when I decided that, you know, I, I came to a bottleneck in, in terms of how I wanted to discuss these issues in, in this very specific dystopia that uh, I developed was that 
I started asking myself, how else can I push the boundaries of charcoal? How else can I push my presentation? And how else can I can I develop my, my aesthetic? Because you, you will have noticed, you know, so far in the works that I have flashed in these earlier works that they are very, very detail oriented in the sense that the entire space, the visual space is filled to the maximum with details. And it's designed to overwhelm the viewer in a sense because, you know, these, these are dystopic works and they, they are in a sense designed to, to overwhelm the viewer to it's an information overload. But coming into the MA, what happened was um, was uh, something happened before I enrolled myself into MA. You know, we, we already with the idea that I, I want to push myself conceptually as to how I was going to present the work, and that was um, a couple of weeks before I, I started school for my for my MA. My my grandfather passed away. And uh, I mentioned earlier that, you know, my, I, I, I was in the Winstead campus uh, when I was in Lasalle. And um, I was actually at that campus uh, years ago before it became a Lasalle campus when it was previously uh, the MOE Language Center. In, and, and I took uh, French classes there in secondary school. And uh, my grandfather used to accompany me to these French classes. And uh, he, would, he, would, he would send me to, to class and then he would wait at the, the food center, have his coffee, and then two hours later, he'll come and, and, and pick me up and then we'll go home together. So when he, when he passed away and I was back at this campus, you know, with his passing so fresh in my mind, every, every day when I walked to school, it, it felt like there were two different timelines that were overlapping each other. Um, the first, of course, ostensibly being, you know, the present. But um, I couldn't help but remember my grandfather and see him, you know, and he was accompanying me, you know, on these daily walks to school. So that, that kick-started a, a very intense reflection, almost a meditative process as to how I approached my, my work because I was trying to come to terms with his passing. And... Um, to do that, what happened was the I started taking away from the canvas. I wanted to, I wanted to, it's almost like a, a, a mental cleansing, an emotional cleansing of sorts, because I wanted to, to take away the unnecessary as much as I can. And I, I was trying to explore, you know, how I can continue to say what I want to say, but with the least amount of detail possible. And to do that, what happened was I developed, you know, this new, this new world, this new fictional world called the every nowhere, you know, and, and the term, you know, kind of implies that it's everywhere, but nowhere at the same time, because it's a transitional space, kind of like how I felt, you know, emotionally, conceptually, and uh, intellectually at that point in time, you know, having to deal with my, my grandfather's passing. So the the space, you know, the visual space opened up because I was minimizing, I was, I was doing the exact opposite as to what I was doing previously. And I, I was trying to, to, in a sense, quiet my mind. And that kind of translated into a quieter aesthetic as well. You know, the visuals that, that I was currently seeing here, you know, the works became very minimalistic in a sense. It's minimal. Because um, you and usually more often than not, there is very little or no background, and what you see is essentially you know the the subjects, the primary subjects that I I I, I would like the viewer to concentrate on, and also what happens along the way is that it introduces you know a certain sense of ambiguity to the work as well because you don't quite you can't quite really make out you know what exactly. It is. Is happening in, 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 in these scenes, you know, and I was inviting the, the audience to become more curious, you know, and to inject their own interpretations to the work themselves. Yeah, so that was quite a shift in terms of how I was weaving the narratives as opposed to my earlier works. Yeah. Your works, as I see it, uh, do not provide an expression of culture of ethnicity. I noticed that in the Paradise painting, you, your, your, 
the portraits that you have are very westernized. They're not localized. And, uh, uh, you know, in fact, in all of your, your, your representations, so you, you don't uh, uh, seem to encase your painting in, in, in cultural, ethnic, sort uh, of images as it were. So uh, I don't know whether that is, and, and the kinds of things you're portraying, the symbols you're portraying seem to be very abstract to the point that there's no humanistic representation of them, even though behind it, you say there was a lot of emotional vibes that created these scenes. I mean, when you look at Edward Monk's work, the screen, I mean, you know, uh, he doesn't need, and you don't need anybody to know that 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 is a very humanistic uh, uh, behavior to scream. You know, everybody can, whether you're a Chinese, Indian, Malay, or uh, American, you know what it is to scream, and and it and it engages you to a large extent. But your works don't have that uh, engagement, so to speak. It, it, it's very complex and, and you know, you, and, and there is very uh, deep thinking behind what you're doing, but it seems like it's beyond the, 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 the ordinary uh, person to look and say, I can accept it. The work that you had where the, the man was, you know, turned into a tree. That's interesting. That, 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 that's something like what Brother McNally uh, did with many of his uh, uh, sculptures, so to speak. You know? So the, 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 the question is that, uh, uh, how do you feel that when you talk about emotions, uh, I mean, uh, how do you want to go forward with them? You know? uh, are they always going to be portrayed as symbols and abstractions? Or would you ever get to the point of, of uh, dealing with them in reality. I guess the, the work paradise uh, shows that, you know, that the woman is hugging a, a, a chimpanzee or something. So it's like coming back to nature sort of thing. That's how I, I, I look at it. But I, I, I don't know how, when you're trying to convey these deep emotions about the grandfather's death, you know, it doesn't come through as far as I'm concerned. And maybe others might see it, but it's something that you yourself know uh, was painful in emotion. Well, certainly, you know, the, the thing is, um, the emotions were the catalyst to, to the process. But uh, I was, the, the reason why they are so abstract is because I was very careful not to turn this into sort of like a art therapy kind of process. So I wasn't exactly trying to, to, to express or, or to talk about my emotions in the work because I, I was very much interested in, 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 in the, um, the process of reflection and the process of uh, 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 introspection. So the works kind of came out that this way because I was consciously removing myself emotionally, in, even though they are the catalyst to the works. And uh, also the, the works are kind of abstract and kind of removed from, from my emotions because I, up to this point, I have been very outward looking in, in, in terms of my work. And um, with, with, with my time in the MA, it's actually, it's actually sparks the first time when I started looking inward into, into, into what am I as a person, who am I as a person, and what is important to me. And um, I'm just going to show you, you know, the kind of the results that came out from, from the MA, which is essentially, you know, uh, the combination of, of my MA work is, is essentially, you know, another map because of the every nowhere. This is the culmination of, of that process. But my time in the MA and with, with, you know, this, with my grandfather passing away as, as the catalyst, it sparked you know, this desire to come home finally. You know, after traveling to Shilak and to the every nowhere, I decided that you know, 
I need to look inward finally, you know, for once. You know, I, I felt like I was ready to come home and to explore things that are closer to the heart, to the heart. And so what happened was um, binary systems, which is the one that's currently showing in NUSS, is the sequel to an earlier series called To Have and Not to Hold. And um, I'm saying that this, this is a coming home because to have and not to hold um, essentially, you know, um, drawings or depictions of things around the house. And I was thinking about, you know, objects that hold sentimental value. Because again, I was thinking of my grandfather and I was thinking, you know, maybe, you know, this can be a, a series that kind of talks about the, the theme of remembrance, you know, and the, the, the theme of, of uh, attaching sentimental value to physical things, which is why the title is called To Have and Not To Hold. The, the thing that you can hold on to is the physical object, but the intangible things that you attribute to it, you know, the sentimental value is something that you can never quite grasp at least physically. So I'm just going to show you uh, a, a couple of, a few works from the series that kind of lead up to, to binary systems. And um, I would like to draw your attention, especially to the painting on the right, which is called The Gaze. Now you'll see a collection of monkeys in, in, this, in this work, and they are all uh, toy monkeys. Uh, only one of them is bought by me, and then the other, the other monkeys are essentially given to me as presents from people when they realize that I like toy monkeys. And the toy monkey is, is significant because the toy monkey becomes my alter ego in, in binary systems, yeah, which you will see currently uh, later on when I, I, I show you the works from, from binary systems. Now, the next thing that, um, you know, this is the... the the first time I would say that, you know, the series become more, more personal, especially in this painting because it's entitled Letter to My Grandpa. And, uh, you know, you like you mentioned earlier, you know, that previously, you know, you don't actually see, even though I said, you know, the, 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 the catalyst of, 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 uh, of this inward looking process is my grandfather, but you, you have not seen any evidence of that. And that's because, you know, it came very much later on when, you know, I, I came, I, when I decided I was ready to, to finally come to terms with his passing. And this was, this became, you know, my, my tribute to my grandfather. And the work is as it is because um, it's a stone bench. And uh, this is a stone bench that uh, I would used to sit on along with my grandfather when uh, he, he would always bring me, when I was a kid, you know, he would bring me on his morning walks and his evening walks. And uh, I chose this stone bench because it's also a, a mark of his passing because this stone bench no longer exists. It, it has been demolished away to make room for, for, for other things, you know, which is quite typical of what happens in Singapore, you know, all things, all things, tend to get demolished and removed, you know, in, in the name of progress. Yeah. So this is kind of like my, my tribute to my grandfather. Well, and, uh, yeah. Yeah, and... Carry on. So, so the, the next painting that, that kind of brings about, you know, the, the development of binary systems is this painting called A Song About Saturn. Now Saturn has rings and rings are essentially the, the main topic of this painting. And rings are a symbol of commitment. And uh, so ostensibly these rings are kind of talking about relationships. And it's also, you know, because of this painting that I decided that after to have and not to hold, perhaps, you know, I should explore, you know, the relationships, the people that, you know, have given me all these things these things that hold so much sentimental value for me. And so that's how binary systems came about because you know it's a sequel to to have and not to hold all these things that have sentimental value. I mean let me just say uh, as a preface here that uh, Henry's binary systems is an art exhibition taking place right now at the NUSS uh, if we're going to the uh, on the second floor, they're going towards the particular coffee house. You see that uh, all there. And uh, and uh, all the pieces of work that they've been showing you now 
uh, all from that exhibition. So you can uh, really uh, see the things close up if you want to. But to go back to this thing, I, I mean, what people will want to know uh, is what is the ideological background to saying that your works are binary, that they are, you know, you know, going in two uh, different part ways, as it were, uh, and, and 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 why why has that become so important to you? Well, uh, when I when I named uh, the series, you know, binary systems, I was thinking specifically of um, how the term is used, you know, in, in astronomy. Yeah. Yes, which is essentially, you know, a binary system in astronomy is essentially uh, two celestial bodies in orbit around each other. So, which is kind of like what I wanted to explore in the series because I'm talking about the dynamics of uh, relationships uh, more specifically, you know, of every painting in this series is essentially about a person that is close to me and myself. So it's always in relation between myself and the person and I'm trying to kind of narrate, you know, the dynamics between, between the person and I. So that's how this binary system is formed in, in every painting. And uh, in every work there is, there are, I'm talking about different forms of relationships. So there are familial, professional, um, platonic, and also romantic relationships. And the other thing that I was um, quite, quite careful you know, of, of, of trying to include, uh, infuse into the work is this idea of flux, of change. Because even in, 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 in the universe, you know, a binary system, you know, it's not static, you know, they change over time. And relationships also change over time. You know, it can grow stronger, it can grow weaker. And sometimes, you know, people grow apart and, you know, sometimes people leave. And um, while the works are ostensibly about people, I was not really interested in, in portraying them in their likeness or, or in their, their artistic way. Um, because I, I didn't think that was a very interesting way of approaching the, the subject. So I've kind of presented them as part portrait because we are talking about real people after all, but also as a landscape because um, we are also talking about, you know, this idea of uh, two celestial bodies in orbit. And uh, I wanted to, to kind of portray these bodies in, uh, in, in my usual way of uh, more fantastical themes. So you will not see any, any, any humans per se in, 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 in this world. There's no human likeness per se, likeness per se. So you will see like different objects. Like for example, you know, this, this, this very first one you see here, which is entitled Warmth is a Blanket. Now I've mentioned earlier that, you know, every time you see a monkey, that's my alter ego. Yeah. And the subject that you see, you know, subsequently is, is of the person himself or herself. And this is essentially a portrait of my mother. And this is uh, kind of like a, an illustration of my earliest memories of, of uh, drawing lessons with her because my mother taught me how to draw. And the very first things that she taught me how to draw were, were cottages and coconut trees and the rainbow. So this is kind of like my, my tribute to her, you know, having kickstarted, you know, my interest in, in drawing. You know, recreating this very early, these earliest memories of, of those, uh, those art, art lessons that I had with her. And um, you will see that I'm also reading a book, you know, sitting by the side of a cottage. And also, that's also a tribute to her because my love for reading comes from her. She was the one who encouraged me to read and uh, I became an avid reader because of her. And you know, um, I, I, I can't help... Uh... <laughs> but when I look at your painting, is that you, there's a binary here between, on the one end, the very sophisticated, futuristic drawings you had, and then these drawings that look like uh, pictures that came out of a children's playbook. <laughs> you know, <laughs> they look serious, but they look like something you've drawn for a children's uh, illustration for a children's storybook. 
as it were, with the monkey and the house. You know. So it's, it's a specialty that the way you have moved from one end to the other, uh, you know, and, and I, I don't know, this is an evolution. You're coming to this binary exhibition with all these uh, rather interesting images of, of uh, uh, you know, like children's drawing, so to speak, more than the kind of uh, earlier pieces that you did that were so complex and so sophisticated with regards to the cosmos, as it were. And, and now you come down to a, a different level. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, I, I don't know what goes on in your mind, but it's very complex. <laughs> Yeah. You can take us through the other other drawings now. We, uh, we're running short of time, so yeah. maybe uh, it take us through all the others. Yeah. So like you mentioned, you know, um, there is still this idea of the cosmos because, um, you know, the, the, ostensibly the title is binary systems and it's used specifically in uh, astronomy. And the works have become quieter and smaller as well because um, of, of this very intimate subject I'm talking about because it's always about uh, it's me in relation to someone that is important to me. So in that sense, I, I also wanted to imbue the works with uh, a, a childlike innocence almost because a lot of the, 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 the sources of inspiration for, for this series are my memories. And memories are sort of when you look back, you know, especially on happy memories, they tend to come out hazy and also tinged with nostalgia. And that was something that I wanted to bring forth, you know. And, and I use this very, very, this, this storybook illustrations to kind of bring forth that, 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 that childlike reminiscence, that, that, that kind of tinge, you know, the, the works. is to basically highlight the happiness, you know, the fondness, the nostalgia. And also, when, when there are paintings that are ostensibly sadder, it's to cushion, you know, the, the, this sadness that, that comes with the paintings because that is not my intention. Uh, because, you know, when, when, there are, uh, when there are beginnings and people come into your life, there's also, you know, the inevitability that some people leave your life. And I did not want to portray, you know, if, if the painting talks about uh, a parting, that it has to be seen in a negative light. So this is why the work, and I think this is something that's quite unique to this series because uh, uh, this this very very childlike, you know, and this very storybook-like illustration that you're currently seeing. Yeah. So this is a portrait of my father, and uh, I suppose this one is the closest thing to to a human likeness that you will see among the paintings. Yeah, and it's basically a depiction of. Um, of the activities that we like to do together. He likes to fish and he likes to watch television and he loves durians, which is why, you know, you basically see that I've constructed him in the things that he likes and enjoys. And similar to, to this theme is how I portray my brother. You know, again, you know, there is this theme of all the things that we enjoy and it's called play, fight, daydream. And that kind of basically sums up the dynamics between my brother and I. Because, you know, boys will be boys and then, you know, we play together, but we also fight together. And we are both dreamers because we both like to read and we like to play the same kind of games. And um, this is quite whimsical in my portrayal of him. And he's actually the, the one on the left, you know, the, the monkey in the dinosaur onesie riding a warrior shark. Because these are things that he really likes to uh, draw, like to draw when he was a kid, you know, dinosaurs and sharks. And... Um, in keeping with this theme, you know, of binary systems and this uh, theme of astronomy and the cosmos, I, I'm the one dressed up in, in a spacesuit. And this will be a, a recurring theme, you know, you will see in, in, in the paintings. Me being dressed up in a, in a spacesuit. Yeah. So this next painting is about my sister. And uh, it represents closed doors. And uh, you see two rooms with the doors closed and it's called late night conversations. And uh, that's because we hardly see each other during the day. And the conversations only happen at night. So that's why, you know, I, this is probably one of the quietest paintings in, in the series because, you know, basically, you know, during the daytime, nothing really happens because we are both not at home. 
and this one is called A Christmas Reunion. And it talks about, um, if you read the flavor text, you say hello when I thought it was goodbye. So this is uh, one of the paintings that bring out, you know, this idea of uh, change in a relationship of a flux, you know, of, of people leaving, but they also don't leave permanently. They come back again and then, you know, the, the dynamics change. So there is this idea that, you know, even when people do leave your, your, your life, you know, at some point in time, it doesn't mean that they go away forever. Sometimes they do come back, you know, and they come back again, you know, you, your, becomes uh, the dynamics of your relationship changes, which is why you see the monkey is very far in the distance because he's still in orbit around the primary system, but he's no longer part of the, the core group, you know, as, um, as is depicted by the chandelier. And the next painting you see here called Fujin and Raijin. This one is based on uh, my best friend. So we play a lot of games together. And Fujin and Raijin it, it basically refers to the characters that we play, you know, in this MMORPG called World of Warcraft. And uh, we played Druids, you know, this, this character class called Druids, which are basically magic wielders who wield uh, forces of, who manipulate the forces of nature. And that is why, you know, my best friend is dressed up you know, as a Druid. And uh, in this painting, I was trying to think about, you know, the dynamics of uh, a main character and uh, a sidekick, which is kind of like how we interact, you know, he, he, he is the life of the party and I, I'm like his sidekick in a sense. This is how, you know, the, this, the composition of this painting came about. And this one is called Us Against the World because sometimes your friends, you, when you're friends with someone, you don't actually start out with as friends. So this one is... Um, a situation where we started off not liking each other, and, uh, and, and which is why you read the, the flavor text, is always, it's about we misunderstood each other initially. So we didn't like each other initially, but when we finally got the chance to talk, that was when you know we realized that, hey, we actually have more things in common than we, we have things that are not in common. And, and that kind of it kind of you know changed the the dynamics of our our friendship and um, and it's also a friendship where we went through a lot of adversity together and um, this is a portrayal you know of a friendship that is forged through adversity which is why the work is entitled us against the world now this painting i i think uh, of all the of all the paintings right it appears to be the cutest and people tend to be surprised when I tell them that, you know, it's actually a depiction of a parting because you see the monkey rowing away from the, from the boat. And this is the, the one painting in the series where, where the system breaks apart. You know, this is a parting. But again, you know, I was very conscious not to turn this into a sad painting because I was, I was trying to, to de depict this as a matter of course. People don't always stay together. And sometimes, you know, it's perhaps better, you know, when your paths diverge, when your, your goals no longer align, then, you know, you go your separate ways, but you give each other your blessings. And finally, this painting is called uh, Stashun Strast, uh, Johnson. And this is a, a, re a reference to a very specific time in my MA, you know, that when I mentioned earlier that uh, I, I had an exchange semester in, in Zurich and Hong Kong. So this is a painting of the MA classmate whom I went with to Zurich and Hong Kong. And she's also an artist. And um, one of my, my, my most vivid memories of her is the, the lipstick that she uses because she uses this very vivid red lipstick. So I, I wanted to, you know, capture that, that, my, that memory of her, you know, in, in, and I, so I depicted her as, as this spaceship, you know, that, that's in the shape of a lipstick. And she loves music as well, which is why you have all these stereo speakers, you know, surrounding the, the spaceship. And she, in her work, she works a lot with uh, flowers, especially roses and chrysanthemums. So that's why, you know, you see these in the work itself. And she's also a photographer. And also she loves wine. And so, you know, these are all the things that I try to represent her in work. So with that, we've come to the finale, you know, conclusion of all the works that are in binary Wait, systems. So let, let's, uh, I, uh, let's open this up to the uh, people who are watching who might have some questions they might want to ask you. 
uh, with regards to your whole presentation tonight. I know it's very complex and it has many <laughs> angles and it's not easy to follow everything. Um, your thinking is deep and your representations are very unique of uh, relationships and people, etc. So are there anybody in the audience who is listening in who wants to ask a question to Henry? Uh, you can put on your mic and ask question. I don't know, uh, Natalie, are you monitoring that? Are there any uh, questions that are sent in by mail? Uh, there's one question um, from the chat box. Um, yeah. It's by Judith. Yeah. Um, so Judith, she says uh, that uh, you mentioned your inspirations. If you had a chance, is there a specific artist you would love to have a joint exhibition with and why? Well, uh, if I do have the chance, you know, uh, yes, definitely. Uh, in fact, you know, the, the person that I would like to work with, again, because I have worked with her before, is, is uh, Liana Yang. And she's actually the the classmate, the MA classmate that I, I, I depicted, you know, in the final painting, Stash and Strass, Johnston. Yeah. And I think that would be interesting because um, she she works with a medium that I don't work in work with, you know, she, she deals a lot with uh, photography and video and uh, installation, whereas I tend to deal with uh, two-dimensional works. So it would be an interesting collaboration because, you know, I feel like that will push me out of my comfort zone as uh, she had, you know, when, when, when we worked together you know, in Zurich and Hong Kong. So it would be great, you know, to, 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 do, to do that again outside of, of uh, the confines of schoolwork. Someone has asked whether you will be in the future going to dabble in color as an art expression. For Mohammed, I think. Yeah? Uh, color. Well, not in the near future because uh, I haven't really found a way to incorporate color into the work. Uh, that is not uh, distracting or does not detract from, from, from what I'm trying to discuss. But I, I don't rule it out. I, I, it's something that I have been thinking about, but perhaps, you know, in, uh, in my current trajectory, it's not something that uh, might happen, uh, at least not in the next series that, that I am currently developing. Yeah, but certainly, you know, it's something that, that's the back of the I'm considering. Okay, anybody else? I've got a question for Henry Lee uh, to pick his brain, <laughs> to dissect his thinking. <laughs> um, there's another question from Nipuna. Um, Nipuna asks, will you be developing this series further given that you have done two related series? Uh, um... I think um, currently with, 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 the, with, with binary systems, I think I, I am ready to close this chapter on home. So the next series that I'm currently developing is uh, I've begun to look outwards again. Not, so it's kind of like halfway, you know, it's still something that uh, it's, it's still themes that I'm interested in. So there is a personal stake in it, but I've begun looking outwards again because um, I think that, that to have and not to hold and binary systems are kind of like a, a, a pit stop, like a, 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 a resting point for me to, to kind of, kind of um, take stock of, of, of uh, what I've done, you know, how, I have come, how far I've come as, as an artist. So I think I'm ready to, to look upwards again, which is basically you know, what I've been doing in my earlier works. But the aesthetics that I developed, you know, in to have and not to hold and in binary systems are, are, are something that I'm still interested to explore. So the aesthetics, the way the, 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 the presentation is still something that I would still develop moving forward. Anybody else? Um, yes, from Juliana. Actually, she asked, um, what's next, Henry? 
do you expect to embark on a new more colored field journey? Uh, I think I, I answered that one just now. Already. Oh, okay. Uh, then yeah. the next question is um, also from Nipuna. Are any of these now displayed at NUSS for sale? Ah, uh, yes. Uh, everything from binary systems are for sale. So please feel free to inquire and uh, approach Natalie if you are interested in the works. <laughs> Okay, uh, next question. Do you worry about the lack of commercial interest? Do you need to pander to the market? Uh, okay. Yes, of course, you know, every time I develop a new series, there is there is that nagging doubt, you know, like what if it's not uh what if it's not not uh, well received? What if it doesn't sell? But at the same time, I feel like um I need I need to, you know, despite the market pressure, uh, I still need to remain authentic to, to myself and to the work, because I feel that um, sincerity is something that will come across when you believe in your work, and if when you try to pander to the market and you try to paint things that are popular instead of things that you believe in, the audience can tell. You know, the, the work loses its, 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 its power, its, its, its ability to convince the viewer, you know, when, when you no longer believe in, in, in what, you, what, you, what, what you're presenting. So I think it's a very fine line to thread. To thread. In, in terms of commercial viol viability, I, like, like what Victor mentioned earlier, you know, my, my, my earlier works are very big. And uh, in terms of practicality, they are not um, very easy to sell in that sense. So, in terms of thematic, in terms of themes, you know, with with uh, to have and not to hold in binary systems because they of the intimate uh, nature of the themes. So the works have shrunk, in the sense because you know it has to contain this very intimate space that uh, I, I'm trying to portray. So the works become way more accessible to the viewer. Yeah, and um, also, you know, in, in Singapore, space is always a premium. So, yeah, moving forward, I also like to, to do works that are kind of more portable in that sense so that they are easy to store. Good, Tamana. What keeps you motivated day by day? <laughs> oh, this one. What code motivates me day by day? In fact, it's, uh, I would say it's, it's curiosity. I, I think what's important is, um, you know, I, 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 when you do something you enjoy, you know, it keeps you motivated. You know, even on days when I'm frustrated, you know, when things don't come out the way I, I'm trying, I, in that I'm envisioning in my head and I go to bed, you know, feeling frustrated. I wake up the next day and uh, I still want to go back to, to, to doing the work, to, to, to painting, to drawing. You know, I still want to confront the work you know, despite the, the previous day's frustrations. So, so you know, when, when, you, when, when, you, when, you, when you are motivated this way, you know, like despite you know, all the difficulties, I, I think then you know that this is something that you can do long-term in, in that sense because um, it's something you enjoy. And um, also, it's something that you, you want to keep pushing in a sense, because that's also another thing. Um, I think for, for all artists, you know, we, we don't want to remain stagnant or static. That is, in fact, our biggest nightmare when we can no longer produce something that excites us. So, so, so this, this element of uncertainty of the unknown, you know, of, of, of um, being able to push past our limits is also something that kind of motivates me yeah it's scary at the same time you know every painting i do right when i'm drawing new things it's 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 frightening because sometimes i still get this doubt like can i do it but at the same time it's also accelerating because you know when when you do it you and you realize that you can do it it becomes a, a, a motivating force to keep moving forward i think we're going to close this uh, Dialogue because it's been quite a long 
session. I, I just want to ask you a question that I guess uh, in Singapore is so common uh, that deals with economics. So after being an artist for you know over a decade now, uh, how do you think uh, you're able uh, to sustain yourself? Is art a sustainable activity? Uh, are you able to sell uh, your paintings uh, to keep you afloat? Well, certainly, you know, um, selling paintings is something that is very challenging, uh, very, even in the best of times. And, uh, um, you know, COVID has certainly done nobody any favours in that sense, especially for, for the art market. Yeah. Um, so there is a, a need, you know, for, for I think for, for many, if not most artists, that uh, they need to need to diversify their sources of income. So in that sense, I also take on uh, projects or open calls, uh, community art projects, you know, to, to kind of um, pick up more sources of income. Yeah, because selling paintings, you know, is, 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 is never, I mean, like I said earlier, you know, in the best of times, right, it's, it's an uncertain, it's an uncertainty because, you know, you never know when your, whether your paintings will be well received, you know, or whether anyone will buy, you know, that's something that we can never control. Yeah. Well, uh, I guess, uh, can we close uh, tonight's uh, dialogue? Is there... Is there any hard and fast? Uh... Uh, Vic, there's one more question. Okay. One last question. Okay. From Nipuna. Yeah. On a, on a chat uh, page. Yeah. Okay. Nipuna? He said, given that you create worlds and mentioned that you are considering more portable formats, what about collaborating with sci fi writers to build stories around the worlds you draw? Ah, okay. This is something that I've been daydreaming about. Not not just you know in terms of collaborating with science fiction writers, but also game developers. Yeah, in the sense that it's it's a it's a daydream of mine. You know, of of seeing you know especially the world of Shilak turn into a backdrop and the stories that I've developed right turn into a game you know and then it'll be I think I'll be it'll be exciting in the sense that you know to, to be able to play a game that, that, that that's based on you know the the, the world that I, 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 I helped build so that is something that I'm dreaming about I don't know whether it will come to reality but yeah I guess I'm allowed to dream that way <laughs> okay. Well, I guess we'll have to close uh, this dialogue. It's been a wonderful uh, session, uh, you know, with uh, Henry Lee. Uh, we have to thank him for allowing us to tap his insights and brains and, and talent. We'd like to thank uh, Natalia for organizing this and for Juliana for getting the series going. So with that in mind, I hope we will be able to meet again in another Dialogue series with another artist. Uh, so I like to say good night and have a good week ahead of you. Thank you very much, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Please be reminded Bye. also that you may still visit Henry's artworks at the NS NUSS um, exhibition area until the end of April. Thank you. Thank you, Henry. Thank you, Victor. Good night. Good night. Thank you, Victor. Thank, Thank you, you, Natalie, Diana. too. Yeah. Thank you, Natalie. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Sitchard.